Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a session with the modest title, A Conversation on the Future of Medicine. <laughs> uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have here uh, Atul Gawande, renowned surgeon, uh, author of many books that many of you have probably read, perhaps most recently, Being Mortal. Uh, before that, books about the checklist, which also has had a big influence on the practice of medicine. Also a practicing surgeon uh, who continues to operate on individuals who need his skills uh, in endocrine surgery. Um, and a person who writes regularly uh, for The New Yorker, thoughtful, uh, very influential pieces uh, that comment on the state of healthcare, such as it is, and ways that it might actually get better. I'm Francis Collins. I'm the director of the National Institutes of Health in the United States. I'm a physician, a uh, scientist. I had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project uh, back in the exciting decade there where that effort uh, went forward. And now as the director of NIH, I oversee the world's largest supporter of biomedical research, uh, which covers a whole lot of territory from basic science uh, through translation, through clinical trials. So we're going to have a fun conversation, and it's not very scripted. Uh, so uh, it's hard to say exactly where this might go. Uh, but I thought it might be interesting for starters, uh, Atul, uh, just to read for the group here uh, the final few sentences uh, of your most recent contribution to The New Yorker, which just came out this week. And, and um, I won't put the context in. I'll ask you to do that. Atul writes, we can give up an antiquated set of priorities and shift our focus from rescue medicine to lifelong incremental care. Or we can leave more and more people to suffer and die from conditions that increasingly can be predicted and managed. This isn't a bloodless policy choice. It's a medical emergency. What were you talking about? First of all, can I say thank you for having this conversation? I get to have this conversation with one of my heroes. Oh, come on. So um, it, it's a special occasion. What I meant by that, I would, we built medicine and the, we built the healthcare systems around the world at, at a time when medicine's capacity to deliver value was really around heroic interventions. Mm. 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, it was penicillin to rescue you after you had a pneumonia that could kill you, or operations to step in if you have cardiac disease mm -hmm. and rescue you, you know, after you've already developed and maybe you had a heart attack, or you um, have kidney failure and now we can give you dialysis and things like that. The capacity of fields that were incremental in nature, small steady deposits of, of um, care over time, like primary care, there wasn't that much they could offer to do that would make a big difference in your future. Mm. Um, but what I'm pointing to is the fact that data-driven healthcare is arriving, and it has already started crossing the curves that my field, like surgery, had a clear immediate value we could provide in people's lives. But now, you know, by the 60s, we discovered that high blood pressure, we didn't real realize this, but that high blood pressure was one of our biggest killers. Yeah leading to not just heart disease, but also to dementia, leading to kidney failure. And we discovered, and it took time, we didn't have it in the 30s and 40s, but we, we found the medicines that could control blood pressure, and now they're really cheap and easy to provide. Um, but uh, we, and, and as we've added that kind of predictive capability, you know, the reason we could dis discover that hypertension mattered was we could gather the data about what happened to people in studies like the Framingham Heart Study, looked sure. at an entire community across the course of people's lives, sure. and discover all these things that turn out to make a clear difference, hypertension, smoking, and so on. Well, that's getting even more sophisticated as we add genomics, as we add information showing that the community you live in might matter. And a lot of the work I do in uh, Ariadne Labs, with the research center I run in my writing, is about how the quality of care in your health system turns out to be very predictive of your likelihood of survival. So what I was describing was a world where the heroics is still what we reward. Our, not only are surgeons like me the highest paid people in our profession, I'm armed with millions of dollars of equipment when I go to work mm. to do my best work for people. But um, 
the people who look after high blood pressure, half of the people in the country, in the United States, and around the world, it's a billion people with high blood pressure, only 14% are receiving appropriate treatment for their care. Even when they've seen doctors, they still have uncontrolled care, uncontrolled high blood pressure. I can't help but jump in here as you're talking yeah. about the heroic model for how we value the way in which care is delivered to tell you a personal story about my own daughter, who's a physician, trained in internal medicine, got expert training in nephrology, the study of kidneys, um, went into nephrology practice, spent most of her time overseeing dialysis, and got very frustrated with all of the ways in which patients that she had to take care of had diseases that could have been managed uh, much better at an earlier point, diabetes, hypertension, but weren't. So she reinvented herself gave up dialysis, and basically her whole practice is hypertension. But she takes care of patients in a holistic way. She gets to know them. Her appointments are 30 minutes at least. She makes about $50,000 a year. A fraction of what she made. A fraction of what she made before. So yes, the way in which we value the delivery of care, uh, as you're telling this story, uh, resonates very strongly with watching in my own family what we have done. So how do we get to this mess, and, and how do we change it? Well, it's for logical reasons in some sense. When, when illness was experienced as a catastrophe that needed rescue, it was a fire, you built a system to provide fire engines. Yeah. <laughs> and so we had all of our insurance was designed to rest, provide for your hospital and interventional needs, yes. and that was the way it was designed. And, and you know, the value wasn't around that steady incremental care. Um, so as a result, today, we still live in that system where the highest paid clinicians, orthopedic surgeons, interventional cardiologists and the like, and the lowest paid pediatricians, internal medicine physicians, rheumatologists, your daughter, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, and specialists like HIV specialists and geriatricians and others. But one of my points is that we're crossing that line now where we are more and more able not to react, but to project and predict what could go wrong for you. And one of the things we have wrong with our model about recognizing how to use genomic information and how to use data about you know, your own personal life, you know, what your smartphone can tell you about how well you're sleeping and exercising and things like that, um, and about the quality of care that you're getting in the system. One of the things we get wrong is that the, the idea that genomics should be, will, will lead to an instant fix that, that addresses your problem in the future. What I try to make clear in this article is how steady incremental care, that's probably lifelong care, yeah. based on what we learn from your data and are able to predict and see that's coming down the line, and then reshape your future, will be the most life-saving way we deliver on that data. We already know if you have a regular source of care from a clinician who knows you, you have a longer life expectancy, you have better quality of care, and you have better health. And we have made it so in our financing systems, certainly in the US, but around the world, that we are undervaluing that care to the point that we're leaving millions of lives and the potential improvement in their lives at stake. So how do we turn that around? Because those who are responsible for covering the costs of care are generally not enthusiastic about taking on additional responsibilities unless you can show the evidence that that does, in fact, improve outcomes, extends not just lifespan but health span, and maybe even saves money by avoiding the development of very expensive disorders that could have been prevented. But where's, where's the path forward here uh, to try to take a healthcare system which is not known for rapid change <laughs> and providing the kind of evidence that would change this in the direction that I agree uh, we really need to take the whole system? Well, so this is where people focus on policy around incentives, mm -hmm. and that's important. But what we're all missing, we're often missing, is what you're talking about, evidence and science. And what does science mean? In the same way that we want to ex create science and innovation around creating the next new drug, we want to have science and innovation around how we actually make the care of patients put data together with their ultimate outcomes. So for example, your, your um, daughter who does hypertension work, um, innovations that could dramatically change the outcomes of patients, people who have high blood pressure, would include how do I use your smartphone to begin to monitor your blood pressure, right. 
log in that information, connect it to a clinician, uh, and it doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be a nurse, it could be a community health worker yep. who is able to adjust the medications. Let's say you're having side effects. Okay, how do I, how do I make changes? Let's say it, the, the medications aren't working. Your blood pressures are still too high. How do we get it under control? And be able to um, no longer make you go in for a 20-minute visit in person with a doctor um, when, and instead have much smaller contacts, more virtually, separately in time, and also begin to have some self-care components of that where you can drive the choices um, and it can be more, um, uh, it's not gonna only be self-care based. I mean, one of the, one of the key things is it, the, a data-driven healthcare future is going to be about recognizing that it's both clinicians and patients who are the customer and they both need scientific in design of innovations and testing to confirm the, that we're creating value, creating real improvement in people's lives. So it's, I totally agree that's the path to get to and, and then the question is sort of how do we develop uh, the appropriate research-based efforts uh, to begin uh, to build that case. I'll tell you about one and I know you're yeah. doing a number of studies maybe you can tell the group a bit about as well. One thing we're doing in the United States is in the next few months, sometime this spring, a launch an unprecedented program to try to enlist as partners a million or more Americans uh, in the largest ever study of health and disease. You mentioned Framingham earlier. Framingham was about 25,000 people, started in 1948, still yielding really interesting data now that we're up to the third generation of those original participants, but focused mostly on heart disease, and much of it built upon technologies that were invented quite a while ago. We have a chance now to take that model and put it on steroids, if you'll pardon the use of what is a very unfortunate medical phrase. And, and, <laughs> and go from 25,000 to a million, but actually study all diseases. So this is, anybody who's interested can sign up for this. What would you be expected to do? Well, you would give a consent uh, to make your electronic health records available in a secure system. You would give a blood sample, which would be tested for all manner of metabolites, and when it gets cheap enough, your complete genome sequence, and it will be cheap enough pretty soon. You would fill out a bunch of personal questionnaires about your own health behaviors, your lifestyle, other things about sociodemographics, which you sometimes can't discern from the medical uh, record. And you'd be invited to walk around with a lot of wearable sensors you know, that are keeping track of what's happening on a daily basis, what's happening to your sleep, uh, what kind of environmental exposures do you have. And as a full participant, you will get all this data back about yourself as well, so you can see how you compare, as well as an opportunity to change your health behaviors with information that you might have wanted to have. So this is gonna be very empowering, but it's also unprecedented. It freaks some people out that we'd have this much information in one place, but that's how we're going to figure out what really are the factors in health and disease. So I'm just curious, uh, having heard that much about it, how many of you would sign up today uh, for that kind of a study? Can I see? Uh, so, okay, it sounds like we'd get a pretty good turnout here. Uh, and by the way, this is not just a US idea. Uh, the UK already has the UK Biobank, half a million people signed up for this. Uh, other countries following suit, uh, some of them further ahead than, than the US is. The latest inventory we did, there are 53 studies around the globe that have enrolled or plan to enroll at least 100,000 people. Now imagine putting all of those data sets together in a way that preserves uh, the anonymity of the participants but allows you to understand similarities and differences in terms of genomics, in terms of environmental exposure, in terms of lifestyle and so on. That's the kind of evidence base that I believe could be really powerful. The other thing I like about this is that those individuals who are part of this will also be in a situation to modify their healthcare and have their healthcare providers do this as well. So this is a, a pilot project for the transformation of all of healthcare, is for these million people, it's gonna get transformed a lot sooner. And then you can see if the All of Us program actually produces the better outcome for them, right. not just new discoveries, but whether it all comes together in ways that steadily over time lengthens, lengthens and improves their lives. Exactly. Now some may say, well, that's just observational study. You won't be able to really draw a conclusion about what works and what doesn't. But this is also a great platform for then running randomized controlled trials about interventions if you think you want to see what happens in that particular rigorous way. 
But tell me something about the studies you're doing. And we're talking about systems, aren't we? Systems yeah. for, for healthcare, and not just picking one parameter and saying we're going to tweak this, but trying to understand the whole landscape of how health and disease come I'll about. I'll give a quick, simple example. Uh, we run trials now that involve large populations across the United States as well as other parts of the world. Um, we've done it in surgery, whether it's with the state of South Carolina or in a partnership that involves Scotland or New Zealand and others. Um, but the one I'm going to pull out is improving the outcomes in childbirth. We've focused on randomizing 120 uh, primary health centers across Uttar Pradesh, one of the lowest income states, 200 million people in North India. And we have uh, 160,000 births, and in half of them, they have been randomized to get an intervention, which involves going and observing the care, taking the data about the patient, and observing the care to see did they do any, there are 30 things that are known to be life-saving at childbirth. We know they're underperformed, whether it's hand washing, treating bleeding appropriately, doing the three things that are demonstrated to rescue the 10% of babies who are born with difficulty breathing, warming the baby skin to skin uh, uh, as the most effective way to, to, to take care of the kids. And what we found so far is that by providing, send observers, observe the care, provide the data back and coach them on how to solve problems along the way, coach the nurses, coach the medical leadership and even the policy makers, that we have had 35 to 75 percentage point jumps in practices that are all below 10% mm. uh, adherence. And in two months, uh, we will then be able to make public, or on our way to being able to make public, what the outcomes are. We, I, I'm optimistic that we'll see significant reductions in mortality. It'll be very interesting if improving hand washing, taking care of breathing, and, and addressing bleeding does not actually improve mortality. Mm -hmm. But um, this is a place where one in 20 of the kids die. Mm -hmm. When we go to a, a US setting, we're not at 100% on these 30 known practices. So across the world, in high, middle, and low income, it's the science of how you deliver on data-driven delivery of healthcare. And you've written a lot about that and collected a lot of data about the really major imperfections of our own healthcare system and the massive differences that occur across the U.S. in terms of exactly what kind of healthcare people get. Your zip code is clearly one of the strongest predictors of what your health is going to look like. And that's not something that's written into your genome, it's something in your environment. And yet it's really a powerful part of this. Uh, do you get a sense uh, that the existence of such evidence is actually shifting the attention of our healthcare system, both in the US and elsewhere, from a system which basically pays uh, for procedures versus one that does expect to see results? Are we, are we making progress here? Yeah, I, th I think that for the most part, the industry in the richer parts of the world are realizing that fee-for-service is dead. Mm. That paying fee for quantity of care, that each quantity you produce it will give you, um, you know, the payment regardless. Because there's such a wide variation in the results people get, um, depending on where you go for your care. Uh, and furthermore, that wide variation has no connection to what that cost is. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're now seeing is a lot of experiments trying to figure out how to pay for a fee for value. Um, how to reward or at least um, neutralize uh, the negative effect of um, incentives preventing you from making investments. It's, it's a terrible thing that our worst paid people, our pediatricians and others who are just at this moment where arming them with data would allow them to make more of a difference in people's lives. Yeah. So at creating systems that are allowing you to reward the primary care clinicians and others, that's going to be crucial for how we move forward. But the key part of it is, you know, what we're observing, whether it's in India or a project, we have a project in Estonia, we have several across the United States, um, is that there are three things that you end up having to put together. You have to put together sound training for the people at the front line. You have to put together feedback in the form of data. And you have to be able to say, show them demonstrated methods for making a better difference in people's lives. And that's the connection that puts it all together, is can you serve them up with the checklist <laughs> for what makes the biggest difference in a new cancer patient? Yeah. Or, and it's gonna be a mix of, yes, this drug, but then also 
a set of, of, of ways of taking care of people, including looking after their social situation sometimes. Um, second is uh, where your gaps are in following that method. Virtually no, none of us are measuring remotely carefully how well we're tracking, taking care of following those methods yeah. and following people. And then the third is not using it to punish people because it's the most complex ambition we've ever had um, is delivering on healthcare. It's 60,000 different conditions that our 13 organ systems can have. We have more than 6,000 drugs, 4,000 medical and surgical procedures. We're trying to deploy that capability town by town to everybody alive. And so you need data to know how well it's going and use it for improvement, not for punishment. And what is the consequence of all this for what it means to be a physician? Because um, I talk to medical students fairly often. I'm sure you do even more so. Uh, things are changing in a direction that makes a lot of sense in terms of building things on evidence. But some are complaining. This sort of takes the personal art out of it and uh, requires physicians to be much more paying attention to checklists and bottom line about finances and are they delivering value as opposed to being the cerebral I know it uh, based on my past experience, so trust me on this uh, kind of doc that most of us once thought medicine was going to be. What's happening there? Because if we don't succeed in recruiting the best and brightest to do this, because it doesn't sound like fun anymore, then we're really going to be in big trouble. So we're in this enormous cultural shift of being in a world where our highest value was autonomy. Yeah. The, the, if you just, you know, the best way to take a good care, if medicine is a craft, like any artisan, you give them the autonomy to practice the art and don't look at their, don't give, you know, don't, don't interfere me with me and, and start looking over my shoulder and saying I, whether I'm doing it right or wrong. Now that we have data and it indicates some folks are having really poor outcomes and some are having amazing ones, the, the pattern that we see is that the places and the people and the ethic that's changing, we see this when I was trying to get, and I continue to work with surgeons to adopt a surgical checklist, and they bristle at it, and they bristle at it because, the, because it's saying someone's gonna, trying to tell me how to do my operation. Yeah, you're checking on me, what? The new values are humility, Whoa. the willingness to recognize that, that no matter how experienced and smart you are, the volume of knowledge has exceeded any one of our capabilities, mm -hmm. and we're gonna miss out on opportunities or, and make mistakes, mm -hmm. um, any of us will. Uh, discipline, the belief that doing certain things the same way every time can be powerful and will help reduce a harm. And then teamwork. And in teamwork is the big opportunity. So when I talk to young people, whether it's young medical students, surgeons, and others moving on, I tell them that one of the most important choices they make is where they're going to work. And are they in an environment that actually enables teamwork? And the new opportunity when you're going into this profession now is leadership. How you take a team of people. The creativity now is not in how I do my little corner of the job, mm -hmm. but in how we collectively measure how far, how well we're doing for our, uh, the people we're taking care of, and then recognize there are gaps and innovate ways, locally, nationally, internationally, to drive um, towards that, those better outcomes. And so the creativity goes into, yes, we're doing certain things the same way every time, but we have to learn from it and then change it every few months to get better and better. And that is where the creativity and the opportunity comes in. Um, so even though it's data-driven and that can sound really like you've turned my brain off, it actually is all about how you use that to turn your brain on. It's also about, I guess, an opportunity to not just be a recipient uh, of the evidence, but a creator of the evidence as well. Exactly. And, Goodness knows we need a lot of physicians to take on that approach. And you're trying to do that internationally. I wonder if you could mention what we talked about earlier, which is building this capacity, whether in Asia, in Southern Africa, Latin America. Yeah, I wanted uh, to go there, so thanks for the suggestion. We're in Davos, uh, so we are thinking not just about parts of the world that already have a lot of resources, uh, but about the whole world. And one of the things that many of us uh, are gathered here, especially uh, at this meeting, to talk about is how to build that capacity, uh, both for healthcare and for research in parts of the world that currently don't have a lot of resources, but who could get on that particular pathway and in the process both improve their healthcare and improve their economies because this kind of investment clearly uh, pays off in terms of return. 
there is a new coalition that just got formed uh, yesterday uh, called the Coalition for African Research and Innovation, an effort to try between the NIH and the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust and the Alliance for Accelerating Excellent Science in Africa, AESA, uh, to see what we could do in terms of shifting the center of gravity uh, from where support has been for healthcare and for research in biomedicine, which has largely been a colonial model uh, and not a necessarily one that's sustainable or good for the recipients. We need to go from sort of a, a donor model to an owner model where the countries that have the most to gain by this kind of advance wrap their arms around it with help from all of the other uh, countries like the U.S. that have the opportunity to do so, but it becomes much more uh, driven internally by the opportunities, by the needs. So the research needs to be in the areas that are most needed in that environment, which might not be what uh, you in Boston uh, had come up with in terms of what we think those folks need. So yeah, we have to take the same conversation we're having about evidence building and generalize that. Because uh, what we learn in the US about the right evidence for maintaining health may be utterly irrelevant uh, for somebody who is lacking a lot of the connections but has a cell phone that is underutilized in the US and could be incredibly valuable in a setting that allows leapfrogging over all the mistakes that we made and created their own new way of approaching health. To give an example, if a billion people in the world have hypertension and, f and only 14% of them have, an under, under, have it under control, yeah. we have the biggest killer in the world, heart disease, not being addressed. Why we have to wait for that solution for how to close that gap to come out of a handful of research universities in the United States and in, and in Europe yeah. is, is, a, is bizarre because there is no reason that that innovation cannot crop up anywhere in the world. You take a group of 10,000 people you recognize they're not being taken care of appropriately, and you create ways to capture that information, to, to try out different kinds of ways of um, closing that gap, give them the right treatments, which are cheap, and then see why, why are we only getting to 40%? How can we get to 60%? How can we get to 80%? Um, there's one state that's done it, Minnesota, that, went, that was able to do that kind of work, hmm. take the, the treated population, people with uncontrolled blood pressure from less than half to 75%, and they became the first state where cardiovascular disease is no longer the number one killer. And that's possible in many places in the world. So you sound like an optimist. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> and that's good because... That's not the mood these days <laughs> here at the World Economic <laughs> Forum. I yeah, seem to yeah, think we're that trying to change that. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, there are certainly people not so optimistic who say we're just on the wrong path with healthcare. It's absolutely wrecking uh, our economy because we spend so much on it. In the U.S., what is it now? 18% of our GDP, and yet we can all document that we don't get that great health care for it. Do you see this path actually realistically taking place over the course of the next while, where we do uh, transform a uh, healthcare system in the U.S. in developed countries in the rest of the world based on evidence? Are we really make this happen, or is this going to be a Davos talk fest? Yes, I think it is. It is happening. It's not clear that the U.S. is going to lead the way, um, and uh, and I think it's you know on the U.S. side, it's up to having uh, policymakers work together to make sure we continue to contribute. But we've got a project, for example, with the country of Estonia and the World Bank, where at Ariadne Labs, we're working around primary health care. We've defined five populations who are the highest risk population for poor outcomes of care. For example, people with heart disease, alcoholism, and um, one hospitalization. So this is a group who have some of the highest cost people mm -hmm. for the country, and they're, they usually have jobs and then are at risk if they go on to the second hospitalization or third hospitalization, they're out of the workforce, they are sick, they're often at risk of becoming homeless or becoming um, purely managed by state costs, and they are suffering. Designing, um, th this is a country that has 90% of, the, of their population already in the, their data. They have the electronic health records to be able to define that population and then recognize that they have gaps in their care. No one addressed their blood pressure, no one addressed their diabetes, and then they arm, the, the experiment is arm the um, primary care clinicians with a community health worker. They've paid for a nurse or an equivalent to be alongside their clinic and for people who are in these five categories, it amounts about 5% of a population of a given clinic, that, that um, community health worker focuses on their care 
with data to track how well they're doing. Mm. We're, not, we're not doing that at, at, at statewide or national scale mm. in a country like the US. But there are other places that are beginning to make this happen. And that sense of competition among countries around the world, innovating in systems innovation, I just, the last century, laboratory science was the single most important way we were going to change health outcomes for people, new discovery of new treatments. Today, deaths under 75, even in the richest countries in the world, in Europe and the US, a third of those people die from diseases where we already have the treatments and they're receiving incomplete and inappropriate care, even though they're inside the system. Another half, it's social determinants of health, and it's only a fraction that's lack of discovery. Mm -hmm. So how we drive system innovation, the science of systems, is what will transform outcomes in the next century. I'm convinced this is the new science of how you put data, to driven, data together and create data-driven healthcare. Well, Tool, I totally agree with you. That's a fantastic opportunity, and it is a course, a cause for optimism because this is something we could do. It doesn't require a miracle. It requires a lot of involvement by all of the participants in the healthcare system, getting away from the paternalistic model towards we all own this and we deserve to have it work better than it does now, and we could save a lot of lives and probably save a lot of money. Yes. You all, please join me in thanking Dr. Atul Goenda. Thank you.